Ephesians 5 and verse 15 comes to mind. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. For the days are pleasant, happy, and filled with godliness. That's what Paul said was. And it's written to the church about us living right, to instruct us, to keep us faithful. No, he said, it's evil that's in this world. The days are evil. Now, why did I switch to that verse? Since we want to abbreviate things. Because situations arise at times that mean you may augment some things from what you planned. Thus, you got to be ready for it. And you must be examining things. Now make a spiritual application. To make a spiritual application is to take the Word of God that teaches us how to live, and in every situation, you look at it. And you examine it. I'm a Christian. Do I need to be involved in this? Or do I need to watch for ice on the bridges? Well, the ice wasn't on the bridges yesterday, at least here. So why should I be that concerned today? That's kind of a question from a simple mind, didn't it? Didn't mind simple. Things change. Things change from day to day. But Paul says, here's one thing you can be sure of about the days. They are evil. What makes a good day? Have you had a good day? How many people will ask that question? Was your day good? Did your day go well? I think the easiest answer and the most scriptural answer, speaking as oracles of God, is that if you live faithful throughout that day, I had a good day. Now, if you weren't faithful, if you reflect on your day and lo and behold, you see you sinned, then before the day's over, you can make it a good day. Because guess what? God has taught us that we are to confess our sins one to another. <laughs> And pray God for forgiveness. See then that you walk circumspectly. Look at the whole thing. Circumference all the way around. Well, how does a Christian do that? Well, you sure can't do it and not know what's going on. I don't know how many times in my mind over the years I've watched people in general live in a box. Their life is whatever they do day by day in some sort of routine. And don't get them out of that routine. I was watching one of these nature shows, uh, one of these characters that goes up and is living in Alaska. And he made a comment that I thought was just ridiculous. Now, because I thought it was ridiculous, didn't mean it was ridiculous, but why would I have thought it would be ridiculous? And here's the comment. I don't like routines. I like it to be a challenge where you don't know what's going to happen next. You know, I heard him say that. He's persuading his mind that that's the case. But then I watched throughout the rest of the program, and he talked about what he did Routinely. <laughs> You've got to have some sort, as bad as it may be, planned out action. Well, now, what is our plan if we're going to walk circumspectly? Redeeming the time. What? Purchasing it back. We all spent too long in rebellion to God. And we want to use the time we've got left for the Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Our lives are to be living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service. You obey the gospel we talked about last week. In the very steps when your heart's fully involved in the plan of salvation, you're turning completely away 
from an attitude and disposition of mind that cares nothing about God to where that all that does matter is pleasing God. Now, that's the new part. Now I'm going to add a little bit that was in my sermon in the first place. That I hope emphasizes that if the sun comes up today and it's 70 degrees, we'll enjoy it. But when it's going to be like they predict it to be, tonight, you just don't conduct, your, conduct yourself the same way. And one more illustration. You know, several years ago, I went to Russia every year, this time of year. And it wasn't southern Russia. It was above the Arctic Circle. It's cold in Russia anywhere in winter, but above the Arctic Circle, it's pretty cold. And we went out one night to teach in a schoolhouse. Now, go back to the little house on the prairie. Any of you remember that or seen reruns or read the books? And think of the schoolhouses as they were heated then and whatever. Now, they're somewhat better than that. But there was no heat in that place. A little village called Murmashi. It's about 20 miles outside of Murmansk. And we got in there, and there was no heat. And we had our full outside Arctic clothing on, and that's what we wore the whole time we did the meeting. And an auditorium bigger than this one. We had a stage, we got up on it, and we spoke. A front had been coming through because you're only a couple hours from the North Pole up there, and fronts can come through right quickly. We talk about blue northers here. <laughs> you wouldn't know what a blue norther is, I found out. And it only gets worse over in Siberia because it's so landlocked. We were prepared for that, and the clothing I wore there would have been hot here. And I had, and I think you got Ken one of them, one of these shopkas, their hats, their fur hats, like you see characteristic of Russians. And it was just right over there. But it's very rarely it's, it, that you can wear it here. It's just too hot. I put it on yesterday and did my walk, and it was almost too hot at 38 degrees. It has to be low 30 for it feels good. Now, you don't do... You just don't wear stuff like that for the general environment we live in here. Well, we as Christians in the kingdom of heaven live in a given environment set up and bound on all sides by the authority of Christ. Colossians 3.17. And I walked out of that place that night and we had to wait for people to come pick us up. And as soon as I walked out, all that could be seen when I had all my regalia on was just about my glasses and maybe the end of my nose. Stepped out, my glasses glazed over, and every hair in my nose froze solid. It was about 20 below. That's, uh, it can get a lot colder. Was I walking? Well, I've been walking circumspectly, redeeming the time in that situation. If I had walked out there, like you would walk out in Houston most of the time. No, you've got to be willing to change, and you have to know how to change to use your time as it ought to be used. Now, the remainder of the time, and I won't develop this as far as I intended because I wouldn't even have begun here if I'd done what I planned on doing. But look from Ephesians 5 and verse 15. Look to Ephesians 4.25. Go back a chapter and go to Ephesians 4 verse 25. Again, I emphasize, this is instruction from the Holy Spirit through Paul, part of the last will and testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to help us go to heaven. Every word in the Bible is designed to help us go to heaven. And the reason why is the days are evil. And we learn also from the Bible, the devil is as a roaring lion. He's our adversary. He goes about seeking whom he may devour. That's the reason the days are evil, because he controls most people. In Ephesians 4.25, Paul says to the church, Wherefore, in the light of all I've said up to this point, reasoning correctly with it, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Do you remember the last verse we sang in a mighty fortress is our God? It's the truth, Luther wrote, through us, 
whereby we overcome. I want you to hold that in mind. And remember, when we sing, we're to be teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. That's also in Ephesians 5.19. Let's start at the end of this verse, verse 25, and go back through it from the bottom to the top, if you please. For we are members one of another. We. So many times I've heard brethren over the years talk about the church as they. Paul says we, or something. We are. That's a state of being. Not used to be, but this is the way it is. We are members. Well, we're all members of something. But he's writing to the church. Specifically, this congregation in Ephesus, but it was to be spread throughout, circulated throughout the churches, and thus, part of the New Testament, we're reading it now. It applies to you and me if you're a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, you're not a member of those who are. You're outside the body of Christ, you're lost in sin, and you're living according to the affairs of this present world. There is no reconciliation for you. You're not justified in God's sight. You haven't had the blood of Christ shed for the remission of sins applied to you. You're lost. You're separated from God. And if you die, there is but one place you've selected for yourself in your sinful disobedience, and that is the eternal torment at the day of judgment. But not so with members of the church. We are members of one of another. I don't think, and Ken dealt with some of this last Wednesday night, I don't think any of us today fully appreciate the true in-depth doctrine of fellowship, especially as it was practiced by the early church. A ship of fellows where each one has his job to do peculiar to the sailing of that ship. And it's the ark of safety which we're on. We're members one of another. Let's see if we can illustrate and make it even clearer. We would appreciate what it means to be members one another, and we'll pursue Paul's own usage of that when he talks about the body, and we're members in particular, and one member can't say to the other member, I have no use of you, we all have our place. The little toe is important. The thumb's important. The nose is important. They all do different things, but they're under one head, one guidance, one will, one authority. What about fellowship? If we walk in the light, it's is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. Maybe this will help. If I were to take a hammer and go down to Andrew... <laughs> I usually get on this side. I wore Buddy out. So I go, and then go down to Andrew, and he had his hand up here, and I just hit his hand with that hammer. Now, regardless of other things that might go on, we know pain's going to be there in Andrew. But if we are members one of another, and you make a spiritual application to members of the church, then all of us would hurt. If I hit him on the thumb, every one of our thumbs would hurt. Now, if you don't believe that, just actually hit your thumb and see what part of you really doesn't hurt. The thumb will hurt most, but you'll, you'll, you'll reflect it over your whole body. That's the reason I say I don't think we understand fully as we ought what the ship of fellows that is the ark of safety of the church really is. And the fellowship that ought to exist. We sing a song sometimes talking about sorrow passing from eye to eye. If one of ours has sorrow, then we're full of sympathy and even empathy. But when it comes to a great many other things, we forget that we're members one of another. But Paul wanted them to know that in the light of what he had just said, this should be applied. What? 
Don't lie one to another. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Jesus answered that. Anybody in need. And especially I could add here from the teaching of the Bible elsewhere, of the members of the church who are your brothers and sisters, would you want one of the members to lie to you, expecting you to believe to be the truth in order to deceive you? You see, that would impact everybody. Remember Achan? Achan didn't just hurt himself, he hurt his family. And his family had to have been privy to all that because God is just God. He doesn't punish people for things they're not guilty of. There had to be accessory to it, either before the fact or more likely after the fact. But it hurt all Israel, even those that didn't know about it. They'd been thinking right, as Ken so well pointed out, when Joshua was down there on the ground praying, he would have realized, God told you that you can take everybody if you're faithful. You didn't take everybody. What's the conclusion? Something's wrong in the camp. And so preachers used to preach sin in the camp. You can't sin in your life without it hurting every one of your brothers and sisters in Christ in some way or the other. No man's an island to himself. We talk about a good example. Why? Because a good example is the truth practiced and that shows forth the people by the way you live the way they ought to live. Bad example works right the other way. We impact other people. So we're to speak the truth. Every man truth with his neighbor. And the reason is we're members one of another. You know, this also lets us know and it dispels immediately this dumb view that was presented as a very scholastic, academic, and highly intelligent view that you cannot know the truth. Hold that view and read this verse and tell me how you can apply this verse and not know the truth. How can you speak what you cannot know? And yet the Holy Spirit said through Paul concerning brethren, every man's to speak truth with his neighbor. But you can't know the truth. Well, then what are you speaking? <laughs> Nothing. So for a little bit as we close the lesson, that's where it's going to have to be today, what do these people do when it comes to the fact, and I'm talking about even members of the church, of what Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed in the actions you do. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. I always tell people, if somebody says you can't know the truth, just go ahead and know it anyway. I can't help it if that's the way they think. Not only that, but logically, it's the oftenest absurdity I've run into. When a person says you cannot know the truth, is he saying he knows one thing? Yeah, he's saying he knows one thing. And what is the one thing he's saying he knows that you cannot know? So that is an absurdity to the nth degree because it demonstrates you can know something, which is the thing he says you can't know. Now, that's, that's lunacy. The whole Bible presupposes that God gave man the ability to comprehend when he uses his faculties as God made him. And the Bible says you have to do that. How are you going to study to show yourself approved unto God except that you use the faculties God gave you whereby you learn His will and put it into practice? I'm going to end with these verses. They tie in to emphasizing the truth. Everything hinges on the truth. All of it does. The psalmist wrote, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Psalm 31, 5. The psalmist further declared, all his works are done in truth. Psalm 33 and verse 4. He further expounded upon the truth, and it is the truth of God, when he said, but thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and uh, plenteous in mercy. And he ends it, and truth. Psalm 86, 15. The great type of Christ, the great lawgiver Moses, could say, of God, 
in the restatement of the law in Deuteronomy, not long before he would die and Joshua would take over and lead them in the land of Canaan. All his ways, speaking of God, are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Again, Deuteronomy 32, 4. Jeremiah, the great weeping and wailing prophet over the sins that brought about the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem, said, O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Jeremiah 5, 3. And then by the time we come down to captivity and we all know about Daniel, the greatness of Daniel and his love for the truth and his practice of the truth through all sorts of trials and tribulations, by the time we come down to him, there was a body of truth extant. And I know that because he said, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Daniel 10 verse 21. And it's strange that the prophet could show the truth of scriptures. But some even among ourselves over the years have asked us to believe that such is not possible. Well, I'm sorry. If the Bible is the infallible and errant, all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and it is, then I just go ahead and know what God said, regardless of what somebody's telling me. If we cannot know it, then we cannot teach it. We cannot live it. We cannot, therefore, show it. How would you be a good example if you didn't have a pattern to follow in word and doctrine in life? Jesus spoke of himself as the truth. I mentioned earlier in John 8 and verse 32. Well, a question. Can we know Christ and can we know him apart from his word? Think about it. Can we know Christ apart from what the word says? No. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made that was made. And on down he goes into John. And so verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John says, And we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and something you can't know, and truth. You can't have God's favor and grace without the truth. And you can't have God's truth without His favor and grace. Because you learn about one through the other. So if we can know the truth, we can know Christ. We can know the way Christ saves. We can know ourselves by being honest, Luke 8, 15, and know whether we've learned the truth and complied with its principles. John said to Christians, and hereby we do know that we know him. I like that language. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Then he says, here's how it is. If we keep his commandments, 1 John 2, 3. Now what's difficult about the level of English that manifests the will of God as it's translated from Greek into English. John also stated that I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and, there, and that no lie, and that no lie is of the truth. Remember, the liar is old devil. He's the origin of lies. What is a lie? It's contrary to the truth. What is truth? It's reality. That's what truth is. If I tell you that's a hand grenade, best you can tell from there, you would say, well, wait a minute now. You might have to do a little more investigation. That liquid could be something that blow up. But the point is, you have to have the ability to take in the evidence and examine it and draw a conclusion for proper thinking. Come, let us reason together. That's what God says. So, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm glad that's there. I know that. I know that at the end of time, I'm going to see him as he really is. I know that just as well as I know how to become a Christian. I know that I did those things from the heart that God in the New Testament told me to do to become a Christian. And those who haven't done those things are not Christians. Well, the Bible defines Christian and uses it. They're not members of the Lord's church. The way the Bible defines the Lord's church, its various terms, and the way it uses it. I'm interested in being a member of the church Jesus built, the one he purchased with his blood. I'm interested in contacting the blood of Christ that was shed for the remission of sins. 
And I must know the gospel and how the terms of pardon allow me to do that. By believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Him, and being baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. I know that's what the truth is. You say, what well, could you possibly be wrong? No. Now that scares some people to make that statement. If Jesus said, and you know the truth, you shall know the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, can I know that I know that I know the truth? So I said, well, won't you even admit that you could possibly be wrong? I will not. When it comes to the matter of the baptism that all must obey, it's a barrel in water. Well, it may not be. It is. And to the one who's repentant of sins, having believed in Christ, who confesses the faith of uh, he has or she has in Christ, I know they must be baptized for the remission of sins. Are you sure? Yes. I'm sure. But you see, there's something about us that thinks I'm being arrogant, haughty, proud, and unloving. It says, I know you must believe in Christ with such a belief that you comply with his mandate to repent of your sin, Acts 17.30. Confess your faith in him, Romans 10.10, 10, and complete your obedience to the gospel to become a Christian by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins. And when you do that from the heart, Romans 6, 3 and 4, 17 and 18, I know the Lord adds you to his church. And I can identify that church by the identifying marks in the Holy Scriptures. And I know when I found it. The problem is, oh no, I just can't. Don't judge me. God's already judged, folks. I just tell you what the judge said. Now, if you're a child of God, you can say the same thing. You know you're faithful right now or you know you're not. You know you're in Christ and faithful or you know you're outside of Christ and lost. Now, what are you going to do about it? Well, to the child of God that sins, repent of those sins. Confess them. Pray God for forgiveness. We'll all rejoice over that. Heaven itself will rejoice. There's the sermon. See that he walks circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Come to Jesus if you need while we stand and sing.